Why, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. How about that sunshine yesterday? Can I get an amen on that? Amen, amen. amen. Well, welcome to St. Joe United Methodist Church. On behalf of the staff and our musicians and everyone here, we welcome you here today. My name is Pastor Chris. I've been following Jesus my whole life, but about a decade ago, I said yes to serving in ministry. And ever since then, I've been a pastor. We welcome you today. If this is your first time with us, feel free to fill out the connection cards. It's that black envelope in the pew or at the table. We would love to hear about you, and if you have any prayer requests, if there's anything on your heart, feel free to just make an annotation that we would like to speak with the pastor or pray with someone because we recognize that life can be challenging. Or if that's not your style, if you're tuning in online, we welcome you here today. Or if you will be seeing this later on, we welcome you to our service. Our church is committed to getting to know each other. That's right, you heard me. We are committed to getting to know each other. And what that means is we need your help. In this pew, you'll see one of these things. Pray tell, do me a favor, pick these up. This is actually a way for us to update our connection information. Now, now, who here has a has an address book at home and you have addresses that sometimes are in date or sometimes are out of date? What we're asking you to do is to fill out this information with all of your family's addresses, the phone numbers, the birthdays, anything you need to update our records. Because sometimes Pastor Glenn will go out to make a phone call and, well, the number's been disconnected. Or he goes to make a visit and we're no longer there. You all look at me like, maybe this doesn't happen. Oh, it happens. So we're here today to update these things. That is what our church is committed to. Our church is also committed to having some brief announcements to tell you what's going on here at St. Joe Church. So I invite our guests to come up right after the service, right after the announcement. But first, let's watch a few announcements for our church. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ashley, campus pastor of St. Joe's Hawaii, and I'm so excited. Bob, Bob, what are you doing? I am getting ready for the fourth Saturday. Okay. You see the same thing? It's a rake, and we need people to show up with rakes, maybe leaf blowers, okay. all kinds of yard tools, leaf limb loppers, and uh, things to just generally clean up the yard with tarps so we can move leaves around. We are heading to Georgetown. Awesome. We did this the last Saturday in September. We had a great group show up. We got a lot accomplished in two and a half hours. The same thing today for okay. this coming Saturday, the 28th. And they're going to meet here, right, at 830? We're, we're going to meet here at 830 okay. for coffee and donuts. All right. So That's an enticement to get <laughs> the guys out. And the ladies, too. And by the way, if enough people show up and we have time, we're going to wash this lady's windows. All right. We're going to do the outside, and it's all accessible 
from the ground, maybe with a step ladder. So that's our plan. And Larry Ewing, who is my partner in this thing, has researched this individual, and she's a worthy case. Fantastic. I'm so excited for that. And you've got another announcement. Oh, I do. I do. Too. Hang on. i got to put my, my yard tools Change down. Change your hat. And, and uh, I want to talk about the keystones. Okay. I think a lot of the guys and the gals know what a keystone is. It is the rock that goes in the center of an arch. It holds it together and makes it strong. Well, we are the keystones for St. Joe Methodist Church. We're a group of individuals, 55 and over, who have been commissioned to see what we can do to energize the seniors in our church. We've had activities already. You've probably seen them. Uh, we've had... Pickleball, right? Pickleball. I just had genealogy. A genealogy. Jeff is teaching a genealogy class. We have a dinner theater coming up in, in the November. And uh, we have an enhanced visitation right now that has become very successful for shut-ins. Awesome. Ladies and men that can't get out. So what I want to do is invite everybody, not only from the 11 o'clock service, but from the YMCA and the, uh, and the Canvas, nine, the canvas, yep. the 9 o'clock service to join us on the 29th of October for our formal ro rollout. We're going to have cake, we're going to have a small gift giveaway, and we're going to have be commissioned by Glenn with a blessing and a prayer as we enhance our activities in the church help make it grow. That is so cool. I'm so excited for both of those opportunities. A couple of more things. Today at 3 o'clock, if you want to come to St. Joe right here, and we are going to be starting a prayer initiative. So St. Joe at the Y has started our prayer initiative on Thursdays um, once a month, but for the next seven weeks, um, anybody's invited to come and be a part of the prayer. So we are going to be starting here today at 3 o'clock, and we will go ahead and um, just cover our schools and our community in prayer. Also coming up is on this Thursday, there will be another prayer gathering, and check the time for that. Also, next Sunday, Bob, I'm so excited. Do you know why? <laughs> why? <laughs> because next Sunday from 6 to 8 o'clock, we're going to meet over at Praise Park, and we're going to have a hayride. We're going to have s'mores. And are you ready for this? I'm ready. We are going to be chucking pumpkins. Mm. We have a, a catapult built, and we are going to launch pumpkins. And we're just going to have a good time. We're just going to have a lot of fun and build relationships and laugh and be together. And so anybody from any campus, any worship service, come on out next Sunday the 29th from 6 to 8. Bring your own pumpkin if you want to launch it. Will there be a contest to see who goes the furthest? I don't think so. But we're just going to have fun anyways. Don't bring a giant one. We haven't built that big of a one. Just bring a you know, medium-sized little ones. And we're just going to have a really great time. Oh, That's just you know, part of building relationships and being four to four is being together. So we are so excited that you're here today. Welcome to worship. <laughs> my special privilege to introduce Reverend Angelo Monte from Alive Community Outreach. Here we have a special announcement. Good morning. I'm Kathy Friend, and um, I've been a member here at St. Joe for over 30 years now. Um, and for the last tw almost 24 years, I've been the CFO at Fort Wayne Community Schools. And so I'm really passionate about anything that helps the students, our students, and students that have, have uh, special concerns or needs. And I recently, well, within the last year, met up with um, Angelo, and uh, he is um, involved in a live community outreach. I have since become a board member of a live community outreach, and they have a program that he's going to tell you about here in a second um, that is helping students at Southside High, <laughs> Southside High School, and. Um, I, I discovered this program, I attended an event at Southside, which was a uh, prayer vigil that had, um, there were, they have a flower wall there that represents people that have been murdered in our country. And it really just touched me when I went to that event. And um, as I learned more about it and became more acquainted with Angelo, I discovered how important this organization is to providing peace in our community. And so Angela's going to tell you a little bit about something that we're doing at Fort Wayne Community Schools right now that he's involved in. 
Good morning, y'all. How you doing? It's good to be back here. I was here about a year ago. I don't know how many of y'all were here in the service that day, but it was last uh, August, uh, I believe. But a lot has happened. A lot has transpired. A lot of exciting things uh, with our with our ministry. Um, I'm not going to go deep into my story. I don't have a lot of time, but to give you a little bit of context for those who weren't uh, here the last time I shared. Uh, my wife and I moved back here to Fort Wayne uh, in 2017 after my cousin was murdered uh, here. We'd been down in Atlanta for about eight years and felt called to come back home to do something about uh, violence. And we started around a support for families who've been affected by homicide, started a support group, uh, connected families with resources, and, and eventually a full-fledged program emerged from, from that. Uh, and we're still very much engaged in that work. But the more that we came alongside families, uh, the more we felt that we, we really need to do something around prevention and intervention. And this idea, this vision of a Peacemaker Academy uh, emerged from, from those discussions. And uh, what Peacemaker Academy is, it's, it's a three-week academy in the summer where we empower and equip uh, young people high school students to be peacemakers in their school, in their community, in their neighborhood, but really honing in on the school. You know, if we can make a difference in the school, then the ripple effects of that could be uh, enormous. And so we started with Southside High School. We already had some relationships there and brought this vision to the principal and had our first cohort in 2021. And so we just graduated our third uh, cohort this past summer. We had high hopes for this, high expectations, but we never imagined how quickly it would take off and how the students would take to this. You know, we always talk about our, our, our young people being the future, and they are, but they are teaching us every single day that they are the present. They are ready and willing to make a difference now. And the, the culture of the school has changed so much so that the school district has included us, the expansion of our program, in this safer schools uh, uh, plan, uh, this referendum that's going to be on the ballot uh, in November. Many of you probably got one of these in the mail this weekend, I'd imagine. So uh, the, the Safer Schools uh, plan includes several different pieces. So additional school resource officers, student advocates in every school, uh, additional mental health therapists, uh, safety and security technology, including uh, some weapons detection uh, systems, and the expansion of our program. So what that means specifically for us is that we would have a staff person, if this passes, we'd have a staff person in every Fort Wayne Community Schools high school. We would have student peacemakers trained in every high school. Uh, we would have intervention initiatives in every high school, uh, st school-wide peace initiatives in every high school, and the list goes on. The results that we've seen, and all of these pieces, by the way, are being piloted right now at Southside this semester. So we've been there for a few years, but these other pieces are also being piloted. Fights are down. We just got the first quarter data last week. Fights are down over 30% from last year. Tardies are down 89%. I thought that was a typo the first time I saw it. 89% uh, tardies are down. We keep track of days of peace, so consecutive days of peace, and 10 days consecutive is a big milestone for us. And uh, our, our students achieved that three times all of last year, three con con consecutive streaks, uh, three distinct uh, consecutive 10-day streaks. First quarter this year, they achieved that twice, just in the first quarter alone. And so the culture is changing at Southside High School. And so we are really excited about this, about the, the prospect of not just expanding our program, but all of these additional much, re, much needed resources in, in our schools. And so what can you do to help? So the, the two things right now uh, that I, I would ask you to be prayerful about are uh, to, to spread the word, to educate yourself on this if you haven't already. So there's a website up, so uh, saferfwcs.com. So it tells you all of the different pieces and explains the different parts of, of the, uh, what's going to be uh, part of this plan. But then the other piece is if we expand, we're going to have to expand our volunteer base. We have this really cool initiative called the Peace Grannies and Grampies, if y'all have heard of that. That Southside has turned into the Peace Family, so we have this 
been mainly retired folks, but we have uh, lots of others who are joining the, those efforts of volunteering in all kinds of ways at Southside High School. Well, I've talked with, with Pastor Glenn about uh, the need to have some anchor churches really anchor our work at each of the schools. And we talked about the possibility of maybe St. Joe uh, helping out at Northrop, or maybe it's another school. But we, we, we don't want to spread the group too thin that we already have. We want them to dig in deeper at Southside. But we're really going to have to do that. So we wanted to bring this to you before the election, uh, before that happens, so that even now you can be prayerful about that, that if this does pass, we're going to really have to hit the ground running in January. And if, if being engaged in the school, going to lunch, uh, spending time with kids, and being a part of this peace movement at Northrop, or maybe it's another school, um, if that's something that, that God is, is calling you to, uh, we certainly would love to have a conversation about that. And so that's all I have. I'm going to be in and out. We're going to uh, the, the second service here, but I'll be back here after that. But we'd love to have some further conversations with you if you have any questions. Thank you, and God bless you. Let's take a few, sorry, a few minutes to meet and greet each other, and we'll invite the worship team up to get ready. So we'll say hello to everyone and say it's good to see you this week. And we'll get things right. squared away. <laughs> Great to just check in with everyone and see how everyone's doing. Will you join us as we sing our first song, Goodness of God? Moment that I wake up till I lay my 
we have our next song, we're going to try to change things up a little bit. It's one thing just to talk about how we're going to be peacemakers and how we're going to be fearful and fruitful. It's another thing to pray about it. So as the next song is playing, what we want you to do is just gather up with a few folks around you and just, first of all, just check in with each other, but then have a prayer. If you pay attention to what's going on in the world, I think we could use a few more peacemakers. If you've listened to what's going on in our schools, I think we could use a little bit more prayer. We want to be a church committed to all this. So during this next song, if it feels comfortable to you, just gather up to near someone next to you and check in quickly, but then let's pray. <laughs>
continues to play. Let's just check in with each other. How's, how's everyone doing? Are there any praises or prayer requests as we go into this time of prayer? Anything to uplift? We heard a great thing this morning about prayers for peace. I think we could use a little bit more of that. How else are we doing this week? Is there anything in particular to uplift before we go to our breakthrough prayer and we dismiss our kids to super church? Chris, I want to I want to give praise for uh, 873 children that came through Trunk or Treat yesterday. Taya, Miss Taya has worked very hard on that, and Pastor Ashley too, and a lot of other folks. But 800, yeah, let's yes, give that a yes, celebration. Yes, Almost all those kids got a pour the pork sticker, and almost every family that came through got a card with our information about our story, our service times, and it was almost 10,000 pieces of candy, and I know we had a little more candy to even come in this morning. You bet. That's going to go out to kids and level up as we get close to Halloween, and we've been having a great crew for that. Yes. We're just celebrating our four families. Amen. So thank you. Praise God. Amen. Anything else? Praise? Yes, of course. Of course. I think we can offer a prayer for this whole mid Yes, yes. Prayers, of course, for everything going on in the Middle East. It is, and it's a mess. Prayers, yes, yes, in the back. Yeah. Got it. So you're having to drive through for food, and you pray that people can get enough food. Does that sound right? For the food drive through walk. It was, through Awana. Through Awana, of course, of course, yes. That is a very good prayer. Let's keep that up in prayer, of course. Are there other things to uplift in prayer or praise? Okay. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we come before you as a humble church here, seeking your presence as guiding and guidance in this ever-changing world. Lord, we lift our voices to you knowing that the prayers are the source of our strength and wellspring of our faith. So we come to here together, Lord, asking for unity within our congregation, unity within our city, unity within our nation, and unity within our world. Lord, we pray that all can be loving and inclusive and community, welcoming all those through grace. Lord, let the church be a beacon of hope and acceptance, living out the teachings of Jesus Christ in our daily lives. Lord, grant the world leaders the wisdom to navigate these challenges that we are seeing right now in the tension between Israel and Palestine. Lord, and as the world watches, we ask you to look over those who are marginalized and oppressed. Lord, to engage the works of justice and compassion. Lord, may the Holy Spirit be inspiring of an advocate to protect those, the vulnerable, in this fractured world. Lord, bless our leaders. Bless our pastors. Give them this gift of discernment and courage and deep sense of your calling. May they be faithfully shepherding the flock here, leading us to a spiritual growth and transformation. And Lord, we also come here today with the burden so heavy on our heart. For those who are hungry in our congregation, for those who are hungry in our city, Lord, those who are victims of violence in our city, Lord, ask, we ask your Holy Spirit to be with them and bring comfort and healing and hope to those in need. And as we look towards the uncertain future, Lord, help us to trust in your plan and purpose for our lives in our church. Right here for this campus, Lord, we ask you to break into this space and fill our hearts with a, a hope and inspiration of what this service should be as we need to transform it to witness to our ever-changing community, Lord. We come to you today pleading with you to do a mighty work among us. Lord, we're praying to be a faithful and fearless and fruitful community, Lord, but we can only do this if we bow our heads to you and acknowledge that you need to be the source of inspiration to make this change. So, Lord, right now, have your way. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Kids to go to Super Church and let me say a quick little song before we close up. You tell me.
Hey, Chelsea. Hey, I'm, I'm ready. All right, he's ready. Hey. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, kids. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask as we open your word that you would open our hearts. We sense your spirit move in the sharings of today and in the prayers. And we ask that you would speak to us as we open your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was, uh, I was in about first or second grade when... The program started, Jump Rope for Heart. Does anybody remember this? It was kind of like a fun, do they still do it? I don't know. It was like a fundraiser and you get kids to come and they jump rope after school and they raise money to do it. And so I went home, I went home and I was all enthusiastic after the, the presentation and I, I said, Mom, I want to jump rope for heart. And my mom laughed. She said, uh, you think you can jump rope? Let's see that. So we went out on the sidewalk in front of the house, and I, I got off the jump rope, and I started to try to, to jump rope, and, and my mother, she was so supportive, she fell down on the grass, <laughs> laughing, <laughs> holding her sides, and I knew, I knew I couldn't do it. Now, some of you had that, some of you have been told you can't do it, and sometimes we internalize that, we accept it, we say, no, I can't do it, I can't, they told me I can't. But sometimes we reach down in and when we find something, we rebel against that. And we say, no, I will find a way to quote Edgar Guest. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. Thousands to prophesy failure. Thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But I'll buckle right in with a bit of a grin. I'll take off my coat to go to it. I'll start to sing as I tackle that thing that cannot be done. <laughs> and I'll do it. There it is. A little showing off this morning. Okay, I was going to try and go 360. Watch out, Jason. He's got a whip. Sometimes when we're told we can't do it, we reach down deeper and we find the way forward. We learn what it's going to take for us to go into the future God calls us to. We must admit that in the text before us today, we find a situation where if we look at it with honesty and forthrightness, we'll admit, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're ready for that. I'm not sure we could do that. The text which comes to us from Daniel chapter 3, we pick up today because, again, it's the same text that our kids are discussing out in kids' church and during Level Up with the curriculum they're following. And just a little refresher as we go into Daniel 3, You'll recall last week we talked about the whole history of the Hebrew scriptures, how God creates the whole world, how God calls a specific people through Abraham, how those people go into slavery in Egypt, how they're led out of slavery through the wilderness to the promised land where they will have kings like Solomon, David, and Saul. Eventually those kingdoms will rise, but they will also fall. And at the falling of those kingdoms, the first, the northern tribes, will fall to Assyria, and the southern tribes in 587 and 586 BCE will fall to Babylon. And at that time, you all remember this refresher from last week, at that time, the cream of the crop, the elites, the landed, the educated, the young, are hauled off to Babylon in modern-day Baghdad and near modern-day Baghdad in Iraq, and they are instituted in a process of re-education. That last week is where we found Daniel, and where we also found Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, found them there in that place in Babylon, and we found them last week instilled within them a certain set of practices. They were still living out the law of Moses that had been given to God's people. When the great buffets were brought before them, they stuck to vegetables and water. They stuck to habits of prayer that we read about in other places in Daniel's text. And these habits gave them strength to live in the midst of a culture that wasn't theirs, in the midst of a land where the language was different and the gods were not familiar. All of that was where we had been last week, and all of that 
is where we pick up in the text today in Daniel chapter 3, where the story continues. The emperor of Babylon at that time, the mightiest person in the world, ruling the mightiest empire of the world, starts us off, chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue. It was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and he set it up in the Dura Valley in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar then ordered the chief administrators, ministers, governors, counselors, and treasurers judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to assemble and come for the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So the chief administrators, ministers, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, and all the provincial officials <laughs> assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood in front of the statue the king had set up, and the herald proclaimed loudly, Peoples, nations, languages, this is what you must do. When you hear the sound of your horn, pipe, zither, lyre, harp, flute, and every kind of instrument, you must bow down and worship the golden statue that the king has set up. Anyone who will not bow down and worship will be thrown into a furnace of flaming fire. So because of this, as the order, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the flute, and every kind of instrument, all the peoples, nations, and languages bowed down and worshiped the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And as we start here, we're faced with this realization. Some things in all the old history of the world with all its trial and tears have not changed. There are still situations we come to and think or are told it can't be done. And even right here, there are situations that are constant and continuous. See. People who have absolute power still long to have not just total power, but total adoration and affirmation of their personality at the very center of that. This hasn't changed with tyrants right down to our present time. The theologian Karl Barth, who did a lot of theology in Germany and Switzerland during the middle of the last century, would remark about how when the oaths for loyalty to Hitler came about, he wrote the local officers and said, if I could exclude and say I am loyal to the Fuhrer, but first to my God, I could affirm that. Later he wrote that with shame. But of course the local officials said, no, no, absolute authority to Hitler, no exceptions. And those who have absolute power still operate in the same way today. In Nebuchadnezzar's time, what he was really asking for was an acknowledgement of his absolute control, his absolute power. Of course, he might have also thought that he was very near divine. He lived in a time that seemed so much more enchanted than ours when people believed in all kinds of things. And Nebuchadnezzar, surely with all his power and might, thought, that he was pretty close to a god worthy of worship as so many other ancient kings were. This is what happens. The statue is put up in absolute, absolute respect, absolute adoration demanded. And it's in the midst of this that we find the same crew that we talked about last week. And we find another thing, another old trend, a trend that is still with us. Verse 8. At that moment, some Chaldeans came forward, seizing a chance to attack the Jews. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king! Your majesty gave a command that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the flute, and every kind of instrument should bow down and worship the gold statue. And anyone who wouldn't bow down and worship would be thrown into a furnace of flaming fire. Now there are some Jews, some who you appointed to administrate the province of Babylon, specifically Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have ignored your commands. They don't serve your gods, and they don't worship the gold statue you've set up. So if those in authority who demand absolute fealty are not a new phenomenon, if they too are still with us, so too is the phenomenon of picking out one group, one small group, and blaming them so that others can climb in power. And of course, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism is not at all new, nor is it all extinguished in our world. We see that present here in the text. Nebuchadnezzar 
predictably, is not happy for he had demanded everyone worship. He had demanded everyone acknowledge his power. Verse 13, in a violent rage, Nebuchadnezzar ordered them to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I've set up? If you're now ready to do so, bow down and worship the gold statue I have made. When you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the flute, and every kind of instrument, but if you won't worship it, you will be thrown straight into the furnace of flaming fire. Then what god will rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar. We don't need to answer your question. If our God, the one we serve, is able to rescue us from the furnace of flaming fire and with your power, your majesty, then let him rescue us. But if he doesn't, know this for certain, your majesty. We will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Now we know how the story ends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego worshipped the Lord, but the king said no. Into the fiery furnace they were cast, but the Lord delivered from the awful blast. We know that they are cast into the furnace as punishment for their refusal to worship, to bend their knee to this emperor and this king and all of his power and might. And we know that in the midst of the fire, another messenger from God appears, one who appears almost like the Son of God, are Nebuchadnezzar's words. And the young men are brought out, and they're fine. But it's their final sentence that stiffens our spine, walks, causes us to walk with a little more courage when they say, here's the deal. Our God may not rescue us, but even if we die, we will never worship. How about that? Now, when I hear that, I think, I want to be like that. I want us to be like that. People who make a witness for Christ without any ambiguity, without any compromise of God who has descended into our world, taken on flesh to spread God's mercy and love and peace for all people without negating even in the slightest the core of that story that Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again for all people. But are we really ready to make a witness like that? Are we really up to it? I don't think we can do it. Not like that, not no matter what comes. Not yet. Not yet. Of course, you sit there and say, Pastor Glenn, <coughs> we don't suffer the kind of persecution that is lined out here for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. We are not under physical threat. And that is true, absolutely true. We should not overstate the case. Christians throughout the West and the United States of America are not physically persecuted. And in so many cases, uh, are, are not even penalized in any way for the practice of their faith. In so many ways, the practice of religion is still free. The practice of our worship and our witness is available to us, yes. The question is, can we stand even short of that? Even as the society changes, where we're not at all persecuted, but things change around us, can we still make a stand there? Can we still make our witness there? The philosopher Charles Taylor has described that we live in a secular age, not persecuted, mind you, but an age that has changed. People's relationship to faith has changed, and we've all seen it. First of all, in every state, in every country of the West, religious worship attendance declining dramatically. Can I get an amen? We've seen that. Of course, there are exceptions. There are congregations here and there who figure out how to beat the model. But on the whole, and across traditions, the statistics are incontrovertible. Religious adherence and attendance on decline. It seems that there's less room for nuanced conversations of faith in our public sphere, where folks from different perspectives can have their faith inform the conversation. This is another instance of what it means to live in a secular age. And finally, and perhaps most significantly, this reality is before us that people, most people don't expect God to show up. The most real thing in their world is the mortgage payment and the score of the football game. And that God would show up on a Sunday morning 
or on a Monday afternoon or any other time of the week is unexpected, unanticipated. And this is how the world has changed. There's no fiery furnace in store for us, but there is just apathy, indifference, lack of understanding to people who claim that God has done something in the world. Does this make sense? In the midst of that, are we able to even raise our witness then? I'm not sure if we can, unless. Unless we do what they did so long ago, which is develop those habits by which we all encourage one another, by which we learn how to make a witness in an age which is changing. We've been talking about what it means at this congregation for our vision, being for the four, how we plan to live into that with those values that Chris already named. And we talked last week and through the week, and this week we'll be talking again about the practices, the habits that we live into that give us the capacity to stand and make a witness of faith all together, all at once, in an age that changes. So you'll recall the first value that we've described is to, that we want to be a church that's faithfully seeking with one another the call of Jesus Christ through his teaching in scripture. Last week we listed the things that were said in all the services, the council talked during the week, and we came up with a few action steps that we could engage in related to that. So here's the next one. What could we do in response to being faithful? What if we all said we could do this? What if we all said we're going to commit to faithfully, we will faithfully worship, engage with others during services? Whoa. <laughs> Chris, you ask us to do that sometimes. Talk to your neighbor. What if we said, not only will I show up in worship, but I will engage with other people in worship. I'll say good morning. I'll get to know people I didn't know. Amen. How about yeah. that? And we'll pray with our church. What if we committed to those habits? What if we collectively did that, developing habits that gave us the capacity for a witness in a changing age? We have our second value, that we want to be a church that's fearlessly responding to the Holy Spirit with costly love in real relationships. Again, we listened last week, all three services through the week, the council talked, discerned, discussed, and we came up with some action steps. What if we said in response to that? that we will fearlessly give of our financial blessings to support the mission of the church and serve within my gifts for the sake of our church and community. Think about both of those. What if we all committed to do that? Wouldn't it strengthen the witness we have? Think about service. If we all said, you know what, several times a year, I'm going to personally commit to service. Bob would need more leaf blowers, wouldn't he? Think what would be different and what would change if we agreed to the actions. We've talked about the value of wanting to be for the fort by fruitfully leading neighbors to the transforming grace of God in Christ. What action could we come up with? After listening last week and discussing this week, we came up with the action of what if we will allow God to bear fruit by learning and sharing our faith story? Where do you learn your faith story? Well, you probably learn it in a Bible study, in a small group, in a place you can share with other people. Have you ever done that? And has it ever happened that when you do that, somebody says, hey, you know, it sounds like, it sounds like God did this through that thing in your life. And you say, well, I never thought about it like that. And by talking with other people with God's word open, you start to learn your story. You start to learn who you are and what God's done in your life. And then what if we all committed to sharing that? Here's what God, God has done in my life. We may not be ready to make a witness even in an age that changes. But the habits, if we learn them, what I want to encourage you with is we will become ready. Oh, it has happened that folks have said you can't do it. But it has can be that the best thing we could do is say, we can't do it today, but with certain habits in place, we will learn it. Now think about this. You know how this works. You've done this. Uh, do you remember, some of you, who's gotten married in here? Anybody? Okay, I see some hands. I see some hands. You stand there. You stand there. I knew a lady once. She was getting ready to walk down the aisle, and her father turned to her and said, it's not too late. You don't have to do this. 
That lady's been married 70 years now to the man she married that day. But, but that day he tried to talk her out of it. We walk down the aisle with that person we love. And we say, I do. And we say, I will. And let me ask you this, those of you who have been married, when you did that, were you really able to do what you were saying, I do too? Trump. No! <laughs> you weren't. I don't think. I think what happens is we learn how to do it. We learn how to do it through habits that cultivate faithfulness and commitment and love. When we say, I do, we have no idea what it's going to cost us. We learn it over time, and we live into it over time. Think of this. I see baby Olivia in the back today. I remember when they gave us our first baby. Remember this? You prepare, you plan. Who here is taking home a baby? Anybody? Yeah. And you, you prepare, you plan, you think you're ready. And then the baby comes, and they hand you said baby. And the time comes that they say, you're good to go home. And you say, you've got to be kidding me. I need more training. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And it's true. You can't do it. You don't know what you're doing. And in those first weeks and months, you make calls to people who do. You spend sleepless nights. And the truth of the matter is we never, as parents, really come to the place that we say, oh, I got it. Nailed. Nailed it. Did it. No. We are always learning the habits of what it is to practice love for those with whom we have entrust entrusted our children. But by learning the habits over time, we become able to keep the commitment. It was a little more than a year ago, somebody called me and said, uh, Glenn, would you think about St. Joe? Would you be willing to move your family in the middle of the school year? Come to St. Joe. And I thought they were kind of blowing smoke at me, the person who called me and asked about this. Um, I didn't think I was really up for that. I didn't think I could really do that, and I still feel that way most days. <laughs> so I, I went out to coffee with a friend, and, and the friend had a lot more experience. And the friend had been a conference superintendent at one time. Uh, he'd been a superintendent at a time when a pastor had been brought from Mount Vernon, Indiana, to St. Joseph. And he says, you know the thing about that guy was, when we made that appointment, he, didn't, he wasn't ready for it either. But he learned the habits. And he said, Glenn, I know you. You're going to learn the habits. And God will make you able. At the very core of the witness of faith that we have from the middle of the Old Testament is the conviction that there are habits that shape us, that habits become our character. When we find ourselves confronted by the things that we have been told we cannot do and the things we fear we might fail in so doing, God brings us God's mercy interrupting our life and gifts us the habits by which our character becomes real, by which God's work in the world becomes palpable. Oh, it is true. We're not facing fiery furnace today and probably not any time in the near future, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. But it is true, we have felt the blast of a changing season, and we reckon with this. Can we as a congregation develop the habits that will help us to make a witness? Will we learn? Can we learn? All I know is I'm here today saying, I don't really know how it works, but I'm ready to learn. Are you? I'll wait for the rest of them. <laughs> Will we learn? Will we experiment? Will we try? Will we develop the habits that make us capable of making a witness, a world in the midst of a world which is violent and torn by strife and which so desperately needs a witness of the God of love? Will you learn with me? Can we learn together? And in so doing, can we do the thing that we might have been told can't be done, that we might have believed could not be done, can we make a witness of our faith in this changing world? I hope what you will be doing is praying about that as we think about this time of worship in particular. There will come a time that we'll talk about chairs and carpet and stage. There will come a time we'll talk about those things. But long before
before we get there, as we move farther into the fall and into the winter, what we're going to have to talk about are the habits by which we live our lives. Are we sharing our faith? Are we engaged in prayer? Are we committed to worship? Because it's the habits that we learn that help us to do that, which we were told could not be done. Will you learn? Let's invite our worship team up. And I'm just going to ask in prayer. Let's pray as they come. Oh God, we ask that you would pour out your spirit on us and help us to comprehend all that we must learn and the habits we must form as we as your people move into your future. We admit the challenges, and yet we acknowledge, God, our hope and trust in you and our willingness to learn those things, those habits, commit to them so that we might learn what it is to live in a way of love for others, in a way that we can make our witness, no matter what may come. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand with us as we sing our concluding song, The Battle Belongs, Battle Belongs.
battle belongs to God, but we are given the tools and the habits by which to make our witness through our worship, through our prayer, through our sacrificial giving and our serving, through our learning of our story with God and our sharing of that story with God. Will we take the tools? Will we learn together? Will we see ourselves transformed and make a witness of our faith in an age which changes? Oh, maybe we can't do it. But maybe God can make us able to stand. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may you go from this place to make your witness and to stand. Amen. Amen. So, so